Hey, we just returned from a two-week adventure, which we uh, visited six national parks and uh, kind of a bucket list thing for Tree and I and hiking in each of those parks. And uh, uh, my wife says, uh, it was a great trip. We're never going to go on another one like it again. But, uh, uh, but it, was a, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. So as we began to prepare for it, we started really a couple years ago saving money and making preparation for it, gathering the gear that we had need. been a long time since I'd done any major hiking like this. And so we were buying some new gear, uh, primarily hydration bladders, you know, for water for you to go on so you don't die on the trail. Best investment I ever made in my life on that. And uh, I was looking around for some things, some other things. We had like first aid, you know, going back to the days of being a Boy Scout and things. And I started looking for a knife that I knew that my dad had given me in 1968. That's been a few years ago when I first started doing some backcountry hiking. And so I'm looking around for it and I I thought, well, I'm going to check the box where we still got some of his things in it, found his old pocket knife, and I found my uh, knife that he gave me. Now, this is before the days of Leatherman tools, so this has like 85 different functions right here in this deal. No, not really. That's being sarcastic. I, I'm not sure what some of it was for. I mean, uh, I'm not sure why you have a corkscrew in a knife. You figure that one out? I, maybe Jesus is going to change the water that was in my backpack to wine. I don't, I don't know. Maybe some of you are nervous by that type of conversation. But anyway, so this uh, but it was kind of fun. And I pulled it out, and I opened it up, and I had forgotten that my dad, who was a tool guy, he never met a craftsman tool that he didn't love. And in his garage, everything had a place, outlines on the pegboards, you know, where tools go. And uh, he always kept all of our knives sharp, and I pulled this out, and lo and behold, he had sharpened this, and I had not um, got that out since the day he died 20 years ago. And so it was nice and sharp for our trip, and we used it. We cut summer sausage with it. Uh, we sliced cheese. I started to say we cut cheese, but I wasn't going to go there. And uh, uh, we repaired things with different aspect of it. It has a pair of scissors underneath there that... Uh, um, I used to uh, cut strips to help my ankle stay in my body while we were hiking and things. And so it was very, very useful. It was fun to be able to see that and how my dad had sharpened it. Then recently we got back and I went down to the knives in our, our butcher block. What is it about, I don't know, does anybody else have this problem that every time you pull a knife out from your butcher block that it's as dull as dull can be? Anybody else want to have a testimony on that? All of you have, have sharp knives. Well, you know, my, mine are, are so dull, you know, it's because I never take time to sharpen it. And having a sharp knife is extremely important, although that's what my dad used to tell me all the time, is you need to have a sharp knife. But for some reason, I always have the expectation that when I buy one of these knives, that, that the advertising is true. They will stay sharp forever. Anybody seen that? I bet some of you have bought Ninja 8,000 knives also at 3 o'clock in the morning on infomercials. How many of you have done that? Oh, come on. I know good and well you have, you know. And you do that, and it ends up being dull also, you know, because these, these knives, no knife ever stays dull. It always has to be sharpened. You're always in the process of sharpening knives. I thought, you know, that's a great parallel or metaphor for you and I in our, in our Christian walk, in our life. Uh, there are some times... <laughs> <laughs> that we get a little dull in our lives. Don't be looking around and pointing fingers at this point, but we all get a little dull. We get a little worn down. We get a little tired, and uh, we need to be sharpened from time to time. So how does that happen within our life? How in the world can we stay sharp and not be that dullest knife in the drawer, you know? How can we stay sharp within our life? Well, the, the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, said in Proverbs, and I bet this is a verse that you know. This morning, we're going to look at one verse. I know normally we take a, uh, a passage or something and work our way through it. This morning uh, is, a, is a prelude to the series we're starting, Iron Workers. We're going to look at one verse. We're going to break it down, and I want to be extremely practical this morning, all right? Because you've heard this verse. Proverbs 27, verse 17 says this, as iron sharpens, say it with me, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. I'm going to say that again. We're going to say it again, all right? As iron sharpens iron, 
So one person sharpens another. All right, how many of you heard that verse before? Okay, how many of you just memorized it as we said it twice? Because it's an easy verse to memorize, all right? Some of you have. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So first of all, Solomon is telling us that iron is kind of a metaphor. At that time, it was the strongest metal known to mankind. They were going about the time Solomon was running. They are going from the Bronze Age to the, to the Iron Age about that point in his life. And so it was the strongest metal around at that time. It's iron sharpens iron. And then he says it's actually people within our lives Iron is a metaphor for people. People sharpen one another. Literally in the Hebrew it says, is iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another's face. <laughs> Some of you have pretty sharp faces, all right? So, and what he's saying here is this. It, it, per, the face idea is the idea of character. And so the way that our character gets sharpened in our life, the way we quit being dull, is we rub up against other people in, in life, the community. Having somebody come into our life and speak truth in our life. Uh, have somebody pour iron into our life. And it's so important, Solomon says, as one person sharpens another, the way you and I maintain our sharpening within our life is having iron put into our life from someone else. Now, over the course of this series, we're going to talk about several different things. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the very extreme importance of you in your life, beginning to understand the need for a mentor in your life. As iron sharpens iron, so one person does another. Somebody's got to pour iron into your life. Also, we're going to find that it's important that God, how he sharpens our life sometimes is people around us like in a community type situation. Also, hard circumstances. I, I learned some things about iron that I didn't know before, or at least I'd forgotten at some point in our life. Iron ore is one of the most abundant uh, potential metals that we have in the Earth's crust. A lot of the Earth's crust is made up of, of iron ore of some type. But there's a process that needs to happen for that iron ore to actually become iron that is usable for us to create tools with. And part of that is this blast furnace idea where they put iron ore in there and uh, the furnace heats up to like 2,730 degrees. <clears throat> That's a hot summer in Oklahoma. And it, it blasts everything out of all the impurities out of it and it melts it down and it becomes usable. And I thought, man, that's a great illustration how God uses circumstances in our life. He brings us through some really tough, hot circumstances in our life to make us more malleable, more pliable, to form us and form our character in the way that he desires so that we can be the people he created us to be. All right? Great illustration. Then I thought you realize, gosh, iron is not only a metal, it's a nutrient, right? And I went to WebMD, this authoritative source for everything, you know. And on that it said that in the United States, there is one nutrient that is the most deficient in people in the United States. Guess what that nutrient is? Oh, you're so good. All right. Iron, all right. Iron is the, most, is the nutrient that you and I are most deficient in. So what does that nutrient iron do in our life? primary thing is, is it carries oxygen throughout the body. Your muscle mass without that oxygen with iron in it would be very flabby. <laughs> That's why I need an Iron Man suit, okay? So, iron sharpening iron, it's a nutrient that God has that he wants to pour into our lives through other people and circumstances around us. So, you know what happens when we are iron deficient physically? We begin to get tired. We begin to get exhausted. We begin to get worn out in our lives. Some of you have gone through iron deficiency where you have just been, oh, there's, you just don't know whether you can make it through the day. And you go and you have a blood test and they say, oh, you're deficient in iron. So you've got to start eating these iron bars. <laughs> you know, and start getting, so you begin to take iron so that you can get stronger, right? So the oxygen begins to flow through your, your body and, and to your muscles and you get stronger. As iron sharpens iron, so one man does another. So what God desires in your life and in my life is for someone 
to pour an iron in within our lives, that we rub up against them, that they impart this iron to us within our lives. Question, is there anybody here that may be feeling a little tired these days? Is there anybody here that's kind of worn out? I mean, you're tired of hearing the word COVID. Amen. You know, we, 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 we get tired in areas. Maybe it's in the area of your marriage. You've become a little dull. Generally, wives are able to sense that more in their husbands than anybody else fastest. But we do get a little dull in that area. Sometimes it's in our parenting. Gosh. Issues come up within parenting that we never even thought about. You know, kids go through different stages of life. It's so funny. Uh, granddaughter number two just turned 14. Oldest granddaughter, 16. You know, she's in the eye rolling stage really good right now. Uh, she started at about two and it's kind of continued on. And um, uh, my daughter, oldest daughter, is talking to my wife and she, we were, she was talking about a situation and she said, she looked at me and she says, was I that arrogant when I was 16? And I said, no, you were more arrogant when you were 16, <laughs> you know. And there's just this process. And sometimes you get to the demon years, I mean the teen years, and, and you just need, you get exhausted. Anybody say amen to that? You get exhausted during that time. And sometimes it's really good in that situation to have somebody pour some iron into your life, iron from above. Who, someone who has been there, done that, walked through it, and you can talk to. But so often we think, oh, I'm strong, I'm going to go do it myself. And you get exhausted because you're not that strong in your life. All of us need mentors in our life. All of us need iron in our life. So it's, it's, uh, it's so important. Now, I, I realize, let me just say this about this series real quick. I realize that I'm talking to some of you who... Uh, have it all together, you know? I mean, you, you, you're just, you know, you're the mom with the perfect kids who go around little halos over their head, held up by their bows in their head, you know, and everybody, everything runs perfectly. Your finances are always perfect. Everything about you is perfect. You probably don't need this series. And if you are that perfect, let me just say we bow down to you this morning because of your perfectness. I am sure your spouse and your children, they bow down to you also in some areas. More than likely, you really need a mentor also. Every one of us needs a mentor. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what stage of life you're in, it's important to have a mentor. Now, here is a great definition of a mentorship. It's not mine. I borrowed it somewhere. I just couldn't remember where I borrowed it from. That's as you get older, those things. I need more iron in there. And it says a mentor is someone whose hindsight can become your... Let's say that again. A mentor is someone whose hindsight can become your foresight. In other words, they have been there, they have done that. They've gone through some of those experiences. And what you can gain is their, how God has worked that out in their life. They can pour iron into your life. It's, it's so important. Now, here's the, here's the issue. Every one of us need, need a mentor. I, I, I don't care who you are, you need a mentor. I, I, Right now, I think you'd say, for, the, for those of you who are football fans, I think you'd have to say that the best quarterback in the National Football League right now is Patrick Mahomes, right? Can't see Chiefs fans? Can I hear it? Okay, all right, yeah. Do you know that that guy not only has an offensive coordinator and a quarterback coach, he's got a throwing coach. He's got a guy who works with him on how to set up, how to make those throws, and it's really not fair anymore for the rest of the league. I mean, last week, the Chiefs played, and who throws a pass underhanded to a fullback, fullback that's hardly ever been in a game, and they score a touchdown? It's just not fair, right? Or who throws a pass to an offensive tackle? I mean, offensive tackles can't get their arms above this high anyway. But he hits them with the pass, and, they, and he scores a touchdown. He is tremendous at quarterback, but even as good as he is, he realizes he needs a mentor. One of the greatest hitters of all times, Ted Williams, if you're a baseball fan, hit last guy who hit over 400. He was, he was uh, just an amazing hitter, but he, was, he just studied hitting all the time. And he 
took time off for World War II, took some time off when you, during the Korean War and came back, and he wanted to keep his edge strong within hitting. And so he talked to other hitters who had hit 400, Rogers Hornsby, Bill, Bill Terry, uh, Harry Duffy, some guys that had, Ty Cobb, who had all hit 400 ahead of him, and he talked to them and asked them to analyze his swing. What was he doing? Was he, was he standing wrong and all these sorts of things? And so they mentor him. He never reached a point in his hitting. He was one of the best hitters of all times so where he didn't need a men mentor. I look at Scripture. I can't find hardly anybody in Scripture that didn't have a mentor. Moses, I mean, a tremendous leader, one of the greatest leaders of all times, needed a mentor. Joth, uh, Jethro, his father-in-law, came to him, talked to him about how to do some organization, some delegation within his life. I mean, the principles that Jethro give, gave Moses is still active in our lives today as leaders. It's are so important. And then Joshua, who followed Moses, he, he was getting ready to lead the people in the promised land. Who mentored him? Moses did. Moses, gosh, I, I don't understand how Moses didn't kill the people of Israel. I mean, they were the most complaining, yinga, yinga, yinga type of people in the world. And he was, very, he was very kind with them, but he continued to lead them. And Joshua learned from him, and he led them into the promised land to be able to, to, to accomplish that. And so everybody needs a leader. Uh, Elijah mentored Elisha, and you can go, Ruth mentored Naomi. I mean, Naomi mentored Ruth in, in some very difficult family situations. You got it all over. Barnabas mentored Paul. Paul mentored Timothy and Titus. And there, it goes on and on and on and on again. And if you look, you can't find anybody in Scripture that didn't use a mentor. David had several mentors in his life. And I really like the aspect of David because even one of his best mentors was Saul, who was a lousy leader. And yet he learned from his mistakes. And sometimes the best person to be a mentor in the situation you're struggling in is someone who's maybe screwed it up, and they've learned from that, and they've, they've been able to overcome it. And so they become a good mentor for you and showing you how not to do things. Have you ever need to know how not to do things? I've learned lots of things of how not to do, but sometimes it's good to have someone whose hindsight can become my foresight, and I can grow as a result of that. And so all these people were mentors, so all of them have mentors. And on and on goes, you can just look all over Scripture to see that played out within the pages of Scripture. Now the question is, how can you say, when you know that you're tired, when you know you need iron in your life, how can you say you don't need a mentor in your life? As iron sharpens iron, so one person does another. It doesn't matter what area of life you're talking about, you, you've never ever arrived. Now, I'm looking around the room, especially first services, I looked around the room. I see some people that are older than I am. And you're in your 70s and 80s and 90s and hundreds, whatever it might be. And you say, most of my life is in my rear view mirror. Why do I need a mentor? Why in the world would I need a mentor? All of us need a mentor. Everybody needs a mentor. How many of you in the 70s, 80s, and 90s have mastered this yet? Let's be honest. How many of in our 50s and 60s have mastered this yet? Sometimes the present generation can mentor the previous generation. I love the story. I think it's true. I'm not certain. But a mom uh, who was got a new iPhone and got introduced to texting all the time, and her children were texting her, texting her, and her grandchildren were texting her. And so she texted her son, and she said, hey, what does I-D-K-L-Y and T-T-Y-L mean? I don't get this. Her son replied, well, Mom, I don't know. Love you. Talk to you later. She got that, and she went, okay, I'll ask your sister. <laughs> if you don't get that, you need a mentor, okay? Everybody needs a mentor. So, if I need a mentor, how do I get one, and what do I do? How do I do that? 
Um, I, I, as I said, I want to be extremely practical today, all right? And so if you are here and today and you're saying, well, if I even wanted or needed a mentor, how would I ask a person to do that? I mean, what would I say? What would I look for? Those sorts of things. So I want to give you five steps, just five very practical things, all right? It's not complicated. We make things a lot more complicated than they are. Five practical steps. And if you'll do these, uh, you can utilize a mentor to pour iron from above into your life because as iron sharpens iron, so one person does another, all right? We need that in our life. Step one, define what you need most. Define what you need most. Now, let me, let me, let me just put a caveat on this, okay? And I know that there, we have several here, here this morning that you're new to being a Christ follower, okay? You're, you're new to all this. And there are practices that you need to begin inculcating into your life that will begin to root you and ground you as a Christ follower. It's very important, okay, that you learn those things. And you can, you can grab a hold of someone whose hindsight can be your foresight, they can help you do that. You can also do that sometimes, especially at that stage of by being a part of a class or a seminar that might be able to teach you some of the grounding tools, some of the best ways to get rooted in your faith. You'll need that because there are storms that life come along. Can I get a witness to that? Just wave your hand if you've ever had a storm in life, okay? So all of us have had that, and we need to be rooted. So that might be one day, one way to be at uh, be, uh, have a mentor is perhaps in an adult Bible group or in a city group or something of that nature where you can learn some of the basic fundamentals of the Christian faith so that help you to walk. As you go on, you're going to find that there are certain areas in your life that get dull, that you get exhausted in, that you need to grow in. There's some circumstances in life that comes out. So how in the world do I define what I need most? Very simple. What are you getting dull in? What, what are you getting exhausted about? What's wearing you down? That is, a, that is a signpost that God is giving you to say, hey, you need someone to come in and pour iron from above into your life so you can be sharpened in that area, you know? So you, you look for things that I, I may need to have iron put in my life. You know, uh, am, I, am my finances... Now, am I struggling? Am I continuing to struggle in finances? Maybe I need some scriptural principles taught in my life, somebody to come up and walk beside me and talk to me about how I can do finances so that it honors God and my family is able to continue on strong in that area. And so it doesn't matter how much you make or how much you don't make, there are times that you need some mentoring in the area of finances, somebody to pour iron from above into your life, walk with you, give you some principles, and help you through some of those rough spots. And, and as I said, quite often it can be in the area of parenting, it can be in the area of marriage. My wife and I had a conversation while we were on the trip uh, about a couple that we used to stay with on weekends. We were in a new church in Kansas City. I was still in Bible college, and we were starting this new church. There wasn't a place for us to stay after we got married, so we lived with different people. Hey, how fun is that, you know? And so uh, we lived in basements and uh, different places, and we got to experience lots of different people. There was one couple, Clarence and Sharon Machaney, great couple. Both were strong-willed people. They were strong-willed people. Tree and I identified with them. Now, you, I know my lovely wife seems so calm and always perfect, and she is that way, except when she's around me, things of that nature. Uh, but we're both very strong-willed people, and we're both very verbal people. And when you combine that together, you can get you some great fights at different times. And Tria said to me, I so appreciated Sharon because I knew she was a very strong-willed person, so was Clarence, and she was a great mentor for me in those early days of our marriage. I thank God for Sharon Machaney. <laughs> and not, not, I'm not saying that facetiously. They both helped us during that particular stage in our life when we needed that, all right? Sometimes you need iron from above 
poured in your life. So you, you define the areas that you know that you're being exhausted in, that you're being tired in, and you find someone um, that's spiritually further along in that situation than, than you are, and you begin to ask them. You say to them, you know, I, here's an area in my life I, I, I would like to meet with you about. And there, let me tell you, guys, our, in our church, we've got, this is a great thing about Boulevard. We have people in every segment of maturity. Some, there are some of you guys who are here who have been followers of Jesus for a long, long time. You've got a wealth of experience in your life. And for those who are younger, like I am, I'm, you know, it was really tough. You know, it was really tough for me. I was always the youngest person in an elders meeting. And uh, one day I looked around the room and I'm not the youngest person anymore in the elders meeting. It's kind of a different situation. But I can still learn. Those guys have taught me so much. So you find somebody from that area and you make the ask. Now you say, well, what in the world do I ask? How do I do that? How do, how do I say, you know, I, I'd like for you to, to meet with me. I, you know, here's some areas that I know I need to grow in. I'm getting exhausted in these areas. I've become very, very dull. How do I make the ask? What do I say in that situation? Do I show up? You know, this is step two. Do I show up with a five-page pr proposal for it, lay them down on it? You know, say, oh, this is what I want to be mentored in or something like that. No, it's a very simple thing. After you define what you need, you make, listen to this, you make a low-cost ask for a limited period of time. A low-cost ask for a limited period of time. I want to tell you that you, there are several people in our church that you could ask to be mentors, but if you go to them and say, man, I need help with my parenting, can you help me till Jesus comes back? <laughs> They're going to say, ah! and run away. Because they, most people who are high capacity people are very, very busy. Now they can help you some, they can pour some things within your life, but your kids are going to grow up maybe before Jesus comes back, all right? So you're going to make a low cost ask for a limited period of time. Now what I mean by that is this, there's some things that a mentor needs to be with you on a regular basis. If you're trying to establish some daily practices in your life, they need to be with you to show you how to build those habits of Bible study, prayer, and things like that. And so they'll need to meet with you more often. If you're talking about parenting, you may need to only meet once a month. I'm going to meet once a month for a year. Or I'm going to meet once a month for six months or something of that nature. It just depends on what area that you're talking about. I have found with mentors, especially the stage of life that I'm in right now, I normally say, I don't even have to meet with them face to face. I'll say, can you do an iPhone time with me or FaceTime with me or Zoom or something of that nature that you would get with them. And we may meet face to face only one time during a nine month period of time. And so it just depends on the area. So you're going to make a low cost, um, limited time deal on that. And you don't have to find, let me say this again, you don't have to find the perfect person. You really don't. You just have to find someone who is ahead of you, whose hindsight can become your what? Your foresight in your life. And I would suggest that you do this. I would suggest that you make up three to five questions and you say, here's some things I'm struggling with. And would you, would you give me some insight in that? Because a mentor only needs to pour out his cup. He's not, he's not going to fill your cup with everything. He's just going to pour out what's in his cup in that area into your cup. He doesn't have to be perfect in every area. He's just mentoring you in these one or two areas. So you may have lots of mentors in your lifetime. Matter of fact, I would suggest that. You might have one person that you may particularly look up to, and just as a general overall thing. But in different areas of your life, Every leader has his strength and weaknesses. What you're trying to do is capture somebody's strength with his iron and pour it into your cup. You follow me? So you're going to make a limited, low-cost time, and you're going to send three to five questions to them in advance, all right, to do that. So the, the, the fourth thing is this. At the actual meeting, what in the world do I do? 
I mean, I mean, it's pretty complex, crazy complicated to do. Here's what you do. You sent those questions, you ask the questions, and you shut up. You shut up. You listen. Here's been my experience. Um, I don't know why people do this, but I, right now I'm mentoring three different pastors who are all younger than I am. And sometimes a guy will say, can you help me in this area or that area? Sometimes it's about a relocation. We were able to do that pretty successfully. And so people ask about that, how, the process and things of that nature. But what happens oftentimes, the person who asks to be mentored says, can you help me in this? And they don't listen. All they do is talk about themselves. If you want to talk about yourself and you're, you're needing to be sharpened, all you're doing is dulling yourself. You can go to a mirror and talk to the mirror and you get the same result. Does that sound pretty sarcastic? I meant it to be, all right? So whenever someone, you ask somebody to mentor you, you send them the questions, you ask the questions, and you shut up and listen and take notes. It's really complicated. Because if you're doing anything else, you're not making the best use of his time, and you don't have time, you don't have, you've got so much in your cup of yourself that nobody's able to pour anything into it. And so you want to listen. You just, you need to listen more than anything else. It's so important. Proverbs 18 verse 2 says this. It really does. <laughs> A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in disclosing what is on his own mind. <laughs> you ever been with people who said, yeah, tell me about, and they go, yum, 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 and they just yammer on forever. The fool is only wanting to disclose what's his own mind. You don't learn that way. You don't gain wisdom that way. Proverbs 1 verse 5 says this, a wise man will, say that next word with me, listen, and the result of listening, what happens? Increases in learning. A man of understanding will acquire what? Wisdom. So, you ask the questions, you shut up, you listen, and you take notes. Fifth step is this, very practical. So, step five is really complicated too. You do it. You do it. What do you do? You do it. You do it. You apply what you're going to do. So often, I, it, this is me. I, I love data. I love to research. I, and I will gather lots and lots of research, and I'll, I'll put it down and things like that, and I never get around to doing it. We've been studying James in our Bible studies on Tuesday, and he has great, great words of wisdom. This very practical. James 1, verse 22, he says, Prove yourselves to be doers, not merely hearers, who delude themselves. Sometimes we think because we've heard something, we've put it into our life. <laughs> Not true. Just because we hear it doesn't mean we begin practicing it. And James says, the last part of that, verse 25, do not become a forgetful listener, but an effectual doer. If you live it out, you will be blessed in what you do. I am all for reading the Bible every morning. I'm all for getting the Word within our lives. I'm all for teaching the Word. But if I don't challenge you to do something as a result of listening, I've failed my task. And you have failed your task in reading the Word if you're not applying it in your life. And one of the best ways to do that is to have a mentor with you who will ask you the questions about it. It's a great way. So, everybody needs a mentor. Everybody needs a mentor. Everybody needs a mentor. Every, you getting the question? Yeah. Everybody get, needs a mentor. The question is, we don't get one because we fail to make the ask. You need a mentor whose hindsight can become your foresight, who will pour iron from above into your life. And so it's time for you to take the step to get some mentors in your own life. The takeaway for all of us today, the challenge is, in what area of your life right now are you dull? 
that you need some sharpening so that you can be the sharpest tool in the toolbox. What areas? Every one of us have it. Don't be arrogant enough to say I don't, because you do. We need to be sharpened. What area do you need it, and who is going to help pour iron into your life about it? This week, your assignment this week is define an area and ask a mentor. Don't just be a listener of the word, but be a doer of the word. And for those of you who may already be a person with hindsight in your life, quit having false modesty and saying, I'm not going to mentor somebody. Wherever you are in your stage of life, there's a person who's three steps behind you. And you can be the person with hindsight that will give foresight if you allow God to use you. Please, for the sake of the body of Christ, step up to the plate. Let's pray. Father, God, I, I thank you for the, for the mentors that I have had in my life. I thank you, Father, for the opportunities that, that you have given me to, to pour iron into the lives of others. And I thank you for the many men and women who are in this audience right now here in the building and who are watching online, who are mentoring others right now. And Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit will impress upon each of us, those who are listening, those who will be listening, I pray that you would convict us of the need to have iron poured into our lives. And whether we're mentors or we've had mentors, no matter what stage, no matter what age, no matter what season in life, convict us, Father, to have the boldness and the courage to not walk out today and say, oh, that was nice. But rather have the boldness to define that area and to ask a mentor to pour iron into our lives. Father, we, we know we know what's on the line for our lives and perhaps others. And you're aware of the peril that awaits us if we just walk away from what we've heard today. So we pray for boldness and we pray for courage in the name of Jesus. In his name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. let's stand and worship.